Uh, thank you, Adam. So this talk is sort of like how do we do anomaly detection for real-world systems. This is sort of based on my experience of different algorithms I tried over the past year while working on a project called Defend at StealthBits. And so let's get into it. So let's talk about anomaly detection. First thing first, what is an anomaly? Well, that's sort of the million dollar question because it's like sort of hard to define like what makes something anomalous. It's more of like you know when you see it. It's like, oh, that thing's different. I don't know why, it's just different. And you really can't come up with like a good like rigid formal definition of anomaly. It's just like something that's noticeably different from other things. And one thing to keep in mind is that what may seem anomalous or different now may seem normal in like the future. Uh, for example, a couple of months ago, um, when Pokemon Go first came out, you know, it was a huge increase in like foot traffic through parks. That may seem anomalous at first, but then it sort of became normal as like Pokemon Go, and then like every day, more and more people came to these parks because they hear like the rare Pokemon there. So you need to keep things like that in mind. They're like, oh, this is not anomaly. This is just like a new trend. And so you need to sort of just be able to distinguish between that too. And also, one other thing, like depending on the setting you do it, you also have to keep in mind. It might not be in a data neutral setting. So if you're like me, you work in computer security, malicious attackers are sort of trying not to get caught. They sort of design their behavior so that they don't trigger your systems. This is kind of different from like regular machine learning, where it's like you're maybe trying to classify the iris flowers. Like those, flyer, those flowers are not trying to trick you. It's like this flower is not trying to pretend to be this other flower. And that's a huge thing you need to uh, care about when you're doing anomaly detection. It's like, is your data sort of in a neutral setting, or are you caring about like, an adversary who's trying to trick you, who's trying to get past you. So I'm sort of talk about um, different ways to do this. So there are two, like I guess, general ideas how we can do this. One is so we can develop a statistical model of like what's normal. So we can say like, okay, normal behavior follows some multivariate Gaussian distribution, and then we look at our data and look at people's behavior and say, oh hey, according to this model, this guy only has like a one in a million chance of doing this, but he did it. That's really rare. That's really suspicious. Let's flag him. Or we can sort of do the machine learning approach and sort of like implicitly build, let's say, probability models. So we can use like decision trees, or we can use support vector machines, in which we sort of take data and then we classify users as sort of like uh, normal or anomalous. And so this has this big issue if we use the normal machine learning approach. The anomalies should be very rare in your data. Like, they're anomalies because they don't occur often. So like, you have this huge imbalance in your data set, and you sort of need to address that when you do machine learning models. And so over the like, past, let's say, decade, we sort of started developing special algorithms specifically designed to deal with anomalies. So these are special like, probability models that sort of take in the fact that we use rare events to occur, or machine learning models that do take in the fact that, oh, hey, this is going to be this huge imbalance in our normal examples and our anomalous examples. So from this point on, I'm going to talk about like, anomaly detection in three different settings using a couple various algorithms. So it's going to be something similar to like the last talk, except a bit less mathematical. And so the first problem, say we have a data stream. So we have data coming in real time, and we want to be able to figure out like anomalies as soon as the data comes in. So this is sort of like the holy grail of anomaly detection. If you can like do this in real time, you can sell that software to anyone. It's like, oh hey, I can tell you attack is happening as soon as it's happening. Boom! Just use our software. Like that's the holy grail of like computer security. And so the idea is simple. Like we have the data coming in the stream. We can see the events happening, but we need to be able to react quickly. So we can't do anything too complicated because we have to give it like, a decision in like a couple of seconds. So we can only look at like maybe the last 100, 500 events, and we can't really do much. Uh, computations. We have to do something quick, we have to do something in, sort of in memory, and then we can act on it rapidly. So how are we going to do this? Well, let's go back to our Statistics 101 class. We might have learned something called the z-scores, right? You might have learned you take the z-score, and you get a p-value, and if that p-value is less than 0.05, you do your happy dance, because then you can reject the null hypothesis. But let's talk about what the z-score really means. It's sort of like this test statistics. It sort of measures how extreme of observation is. Like, if the observation is extreme enough, then the z-score is very high in absolute value, and we reject our null hypothesis. So the z-score is sort of like this measure of extremeness. And it has like two main parts. It has the mean and the standard deviation. And it's sort of like a measure of like how many standard deviations away from the mean you are. You're like three standard deviations, you're five standard deviations. And if you are three standard deviations, five standard deviations, that's very extreme, and we like reject the null hypothesis for that. 
And so we're going to use this idea of like a mean and standard deviation, but we're going to modify it a bit. Because it turns out mean and standard deviation aren't really good at handling anomalies. And so, well, well first things first, like, uh, let's talk about how we do this in like data streams. So first we have a moving average and a moving standard deviation. We look at the last n points, we keep track of the mean of the last n points, and we keep track of the standard deviation of the last n points. And then we can just calculate those z-scores on the fly for each of those points. We can say, oh, hey, here's some point, take out the moving mean, divide by the moving standard deviation, boom, we have a z-score for that. And we flag if the z-score exceeds some threshold. If it's like above three or if it's above four, we flag it. But as I was saying, like, the mean and standard deviation have some problems. They're very sensitive to extreme values. And the thing is, both of these are very sensitive. Like, one extreme value, if you have a data set of like 1,000 points and then like one value that's like super high compared to everything else, it will greatly skew the standard deviation and it will greatly skew the mean. And as a result, the value of these z-scores really decrease, the effectiveness of these z-scores decreases effect, like a lot when you have extreme values. So how do we deal with that? And so just before I go into how we deal with that, let's talk about like, why this mean and standard deviation is so sensitive to these extreme values. Well, what is the mean? Well, it turns out you might have learned means, okay, you take the data points, you divide by the number there are, boom, that's the number. But what actual optimization is that doing? Well, it turns out that the mean is actually the number that solves this uh, optimization at the top. You're basically trying to do this optimization if you've taken like a functional analysis course, this is the optimization of the L2 norm. And essentially what happens is you have, you're trying to fix some number s, such that when you take the s, the, uh, each of your observations minus s, square that, sum that up, and take the, uh, set, the square root of that, you find the s that sort of minimizes that. So it's like basically, you have a vector of points, you have your vector s, which is just like a vector filled with s, 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 and you're trying to minimize the distance between the two. And this is a big issue, because that squared term, so, if this is small, like this is one, this isn't an issue, but if we have like xi minus s being 10,000, 10,000 squared is a big number, it's like one times 10 to the 10, okay? So that's gonna like greatly impact that sum. So that's the result, those extreme values are gonna greatly, those extreme deviations are gonna greatly impact the sum, uh, impact the sum and thereby impact the mean. We don't want that. Well, what can we do about it? Well, we can use the median. And it turns out the median is actually this optimization in the L1 space. Um, so basically what you do when you take the median is you're trying to optimize, find, well that should be an uh, M instead of an S, oh, my bad. Um, so basically what you're trying to do is you tab your list of numbers, and you're trying to find M such that you minimize the absolute um, distance. So like the, take the absolute value of the distance and you sum that up and find the M that minimizes that. And so when you do this, it turns out that the median is actually more robust against these extreme values. You have that deviation of 10,000, it only contributes 10,000 10, to the sum. It doesn't contribute, uh, what would be the 10 billion to the sum. And so as a result, like median and this optimization in the L1 norm is more robust to extreme values. And this is an idea we're gonna come back, um, and talk about later on in this slide, but just remember that L2 optimization is sensitive to outliers, L1 is op uh, robust. And I guess the general thing for people who are like interested in mathematics, the higher LP spaces you go, the more sensitive you are to extreme values. So if you do like an L3 optimization or an L5 or even L infinity, you're highly sensitive to your outliers. And just to sort of visualize this, so basically all I did is I created a data set of like 100 points of just like a value 100, and I threw in one extreme value. And so the extremeness of the value is on the bottom on the x-axis, and then I show how the mean and standard deviation are affected by it. And if you notice, you sort of see this like exponential shape. It should be more quadratic, but as you can see, like just by extreme, uh, increasing one value, just fixing the data set and only changing one value, uh, it can greatly affect the mean and greatly affects the standard deviation. So this is where we talked about the median. So let's talk about how can we, the median is sort of like analogous to our mean. It's sort of like a measure of central, cent centrality. So now, what's the analogous of the central uh, standard deviation? Well, that's called the median absolute deviation, and it's given by this formula. Essentially, the median absolute deviation is sort of like a way to think about the spread of the data. Standard deviation is one way to think about spread, but it's sensitive to our extremeness. So let's talk about the median absolute deviation. It's 
basically, you take each number, um, each of your observations, subtract the median, and take the median of that. And so the, a standard deviation, you might remember, is sort of like the mean of the deviation of, from the means. And so the median absolute deviation is sort of like the median from the deviation from the median. And it sort of gives you this way, this, this measure of spread from, of the data that sort of doesn't care about those extreme values. And one way to visualize this is say we have the data set, the blue points represent our data, this red arrow pointing up represents the mean, the bottom, uh, the green arrow pointing down represents the median, and the left and right arrows represent the measure of spread. So for the red, left red arrow and the right, left, right, the right red arrow, we have two standard deviations. And so we have this one point out here, this one blue point, extreme value, and it's greatly throwing off the standard deviation. It's like most of the data is within two standard deviations just because that blue point is right out there. On the other hand, we have the median, and we have two median absolute deviations above and below the median. And you can see that like, it doesn't really care about this like, extreme value out here. It's much smaller, it's much more robust, and captures more of the data, and sort of like better for this extreme value. So now we have this median, and we have this median absolute deviation. Let's go back to that z-score idea. We can now talk about modified z-scores. So instead of using z-score, which is like x minus mean over standard deviations, we can now do, um, to calculate a modified z-score, you basically do x minus the median over the modified absolute deviation, uh, median absolute deviation. And then you throw in this, uh, multiply by this constant 0.6745, that's just so like, um, it works out nice math uh, mathematically when you integrate things. It's just like a constant of, just for the integration. Uh, and basically, this allows you to use this modified z-score, and so now we can like, have this better measure of extremeness to, uh, for our data that isn't thrown off by our outliers. Because like, as the outliers come in, they, sort of increase the, they would increase the mean and standard deviation, and thus future points would be less suspicious or considered less extreme. Whereas with the modified z-scores, because we're using median and median absolute deviation, which are robust to the extremeness, they sort of like, stay constant in behavior as they look uh, through the new points. And then we can sort of use these modified z-scores in the same way we would use these uh, normal z-scores. So if we can say, like, if the modified z-score is above 3, or if it's above 3.5, then we flag it as being highly suspicious. Now let's talk about density-based anomaly detection. So this is basically a point in space. So now we have, mm, uh, so now we don't have to do this in real time. It's not like data streams where we need to do, like, real time, maybe quick and dirty. We have, sort of now have the point in space. We can now do like, much more complicated calculations and computations. And so we have our points in some n-dimensional space, and our goal is to find which point is sort of like noticeably different from the others. And so if you look at this plot, you can kind of see like, which one is noticeably different. There's this guy way up here that's like, way far away from all the other points. And so the goal of like, density-based anomaly detection is we want to be able to figure out this person. We want to be able to flag him as being different from everyone else. And so just a quick primer about, like, when we talk about density-based methods in, like, machine learning, like DB scan things, like, what do we mean by density? Well, we're talking about probability density. So in statistics, you assume that, like, the data is generated by some um, probability density functions. If you take a stats course, it's like the PDF of a distribution. A normal distribution has that PDF of, like, 1 over 2 pi, blah, 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 uh, for example. Mm -hmm. And so the goal of density-based methods is sort of, like, Try to estimate the underlying probability density function generating the data. And then based on using that, we can sort of use the estimated density function to sort of classify things. So for like DB scan or level set tree clustering, we look at the density function and we can classify points to get, uh, cluster points together based on uh, like do they come from the same um, areas of density. And so this algorithm we talk about is called local outlier factor. It's a pretty famous like, anomaly detection algorithm, sort of like the standard one for this type of problem. And there's been uh, many like, improvements to it over the past couple years. But the goal is to sort of like, quantify the relative density about a point. And so the idea is that like, if you're an anomaly, you should be like, way oscillated by yourself. And so the relative density about you should be very small. You're coming in like, a very sparse region by yourself. You're not like, in the middle of all the points with all your friends around here. Like, these have very high density regions. This is a low density region because it's very sparse.
And the way we're going to do this is by sort of looking at a small neighborhood around each point and saying, like, OK, based on the size of this neighborhood, we can sort of quantify the relative density of each point. And so the way we're going to do this is so for each data point, we're going to calculate the k distance. So this k distance is the near distance to the k nearest neighbor. So if you've heard of like k and n algorithm, k nearest neighbor, you basically calculate the distance to like the k the nearest point. And so that's essentially what we're going to do. And the heuristic behind this is that like the k distance is going to give us some notion of volume. Like think back to like your elementary school uh, science course. You learn density is equal to mass over volume. Well, what's our mass in this case? The mass is the number of points contained in our circle. The volume is sort of like the size of the circle. And so the goal is, I mean, the idea behind this is that like the farther away you are from everyone else, the higher like volume you should have. So compared to this point, like this outlier, this is this k uh, distance. It's huge because it has to look very far away to find five points close to it. On the other hand, this guy who's in the middle of everyone doesn't have to look that far to find five other points. He's like in the center of attention. He can find five friends pretty easily. And now, so we have the uh, k distance. We can now talk about the reachability distance. So the reachability distance is sort of like a pseudo distance metric. And it sort of gives us a way to think about like how do your neighbors think about you. So the k reachability distance is sort of like the max between the k distance of b and the actual distance between a and b. And so the thing is, it's like, um, if you're one of your nearest, if you, so basically the idea is that like, how do your neighbors see you? So if this guy, so the outlier, his neighbors don't really see them as like one of his friends. So like, you may be, so this red point here and this green point here, this is one of his nearest neighbors, but he's not one of his nearest neighbors. So it's like, if you're an outlier, your closest friends don't see you as a friend. Yeah, that, that hits a bit too close to home for some of you guys, right? <laughs> Yeah, so essentially, if you're a normal point, then your closest friends see you as one of their friends. If you're an outlier, your closest friends don't see you as one of their friends. And that's essentially what that reachability distance sort of like intuitively captures. And that's how we're going to use it for actually calculating density. So now we can actually calculate, like I said, the goal is to like compute the relative density. This is where we're going to actually do this now. So with the local reachability density, we're going to sort of compute the average reachability distance from each of its points of each of its neighbors. And so we're going to use this formula. And essentially what happens is that if your reachability distance to your neighbors is very low, so if you're, like, you're an outlier, then the reachability distance to your neighbors should be the distance between you and them. Like it shouldn't be the k distance. So this is going to be like a very large summation, because you're going to have to like look very far to get to your five nearest neighbors. And so this denominator becomes high, thus the overall thing becomes some very small value. So if you're an outlier, this will be very small. On the other hand, if you're a normal point, the average reachability to your neighbors should be about the same. It should be about your k distance. Therefore, this is sort of like a more constant term. It should be some larger value. And then we can count the local outlier factors, where we take the average local reachability distance of your neighbors and divide it by the average local, uh, your local reachability distance. Uh, re local reachability density. And so what this will do is sort of compares like the density of your neighbors compared to the density of you. And this is important, because like if you're a normal point, the density of your neighbors should be about the same as yours. Like you're coming from the same space, you're in the same red neighborhood. So this should be about one if you're a normal point. On the other hand, if you're this outlier, the density of your friends is much higher than the density of yours. So like this value will be very big at the top. So Large value divided by small value gives you large value on top. So as the local outlier factor score gets higher, the more likely you are an outlier. And so what you can do in practice when you use local outlier factor is you essentially calculate this local outlier factor score for each point. If the value is 3 or 2.5, um, that is basically something spooky. Because that like, number basically gives you about like, how much more dense your neighbors are compared to you. If your local outlier factor for this guy is like 2.5, Eight or two point nine, so it's about three. So let's say it's about three, and say, okay, his local outlier factor score is about three. That means his neighbors come from a region that is three times as dense as uh, his neighborhood. That's really suspicious because that means you're coming from a very different, like, probably de probably density re region. And like I said, normal points should have about score between one and one point five. They're about the same density as their neighbors. Anomalous points have a much higher score. 
Um, yeah, if the density is like three, that basically means you come from a region that's three times as dense. Now let's talk about the big um, recent trend in anomaly detection. How do you detect anomalies in time series? So this is a simple like, problem setup. Given some activity uh, indexed by time, can we sort of identify the extreme spikes or extreme troughs in the time series? And the goal overall is to identify global anomalies, which are something that's like anomalous on a global sense of like, oh, hey, this is a super high speak ov overall, and, very, and local anomalies, where it's like, oh, hey, in like a past day or two, this is like a huge spike or a huge trough. What's causing that? Where it's like not too big overall. So this first algorithm is called the seasonal hybrid extreme studentized deviation, or seasonal hybrid ESD. This was developed at Twitter uh, last year. So this algorithm has two steps. It has the seasonal decomposition stage and it has the ESD stage. And this is why it's called seasonal hybrid, because you combine seasonality with the ESD. And the idea from this algorithm is sort of, we're going to first remove the seasonality trends from the time series data. And once we remove the seasonality, we now sort of have like the core or the meat of the time series data. And then we're going to try to find anomalies in that. So it's like, remove the noise we don't care about that then find anomalies and stuff we actually do care about. So seasonal decomposition. So essentially, you have some time series. And you can sort of break it down to different components. Uh, depending on the method you can use, you can break it down to four components, five components. Uh, in our case, we're going to break it down to three components. The trend, the seasonality, and the residuals. So the trend is sort of like the meat of the data. So if we're looking at user behavior, the trend is sort of like reflects a user's behavior over, um, over time. The seasonality represents periodic things. So periodic things would be like, oh, hey, it's Friday. Let's not do any work in the afternoon, because who cares? It's Friday. As some uh, seasonal trend, you would notice like, every week that this user's activity decreases on Friday. It's not something specific to the user, per se, because it could happen to all employees in the company. And then finally, we have the residual, which is just like our random noise component, which is noise. It's just like our error terms for the time series. It can't be explained by, if your time series cannot be explained by the first two, it's explained by the residual noise. And the goal is to get like the meat. We want the trend component. And so what we do in this stage is we remove the, season, uh, the seasonal component from the time series, and then we just focus on the trend component. And so here's an example of seasonality. So we'll say we're looking at user behavior. And it's almost like there's this overall trend of like activities increasing um, as weeks go by. But you also notice it's like the seasonality component. Like near the weekends, the activity dips. And so we want to remove this fact that the activity dips near the weekends, but keep this overall increasing trend in the data. That's, that's the thing we care about. And next, we're going to look at extreme studentized deviate tests. And so this is a really like, statistical procedure to like, iteratively test for an outlier in a data set. And it sort of works like a standard, uh, standard statistical hypothesis testing. You specify some alpha value, and then you also specify the maximum amount of anomalies you're looking for. So you can say alpha is equal to 0.05, and then we're also looking for 20 anomalies in our data set. And then the thing about like, iterative testing and statistics is it's sort of you like, have to uh, compensate for the fact that you're testing something multiple times. The multiple testing uh, fallacy is a like, huge issue with statistics. If you test the data set enough times, you can eventually find some like, really crazy uh, pattern, or really um, crazy trend. There's an XKCD comic of like, they're testing jelly beans for cancer, and they eventually find that green jelly beans cause cancer, because they tested it like 20-something times. And so what ESD does is sort of like naturally applies a, a statistical correction to the, uh, to the methodology. So that way you can like test your hypothesis multiple times. You can do this iterative testing without worrying about the fact that, oh, hey, I'm testing for 20 outliers iteratively, and I don't have to worry about the fact that I'm doing 20 different tests each time. And so the way we do this is for each data point, we sort of compute a G-score, which is the absolute value of the z-score. And when we say z-score, you can use the actual z-score of mean minus divided by standard deviation, or you can use that modified z-score I was talking about earlier. And then you look at the point with the highest g-score. So this is the point with the highest level of extremeness in your uh, data. And then using the pre-specified alpha value you gave beforehand, you calculate some critical value. If your g-score is greater than the critical value, you flag the point as anomalous, and then you remove this point from the data, and then you repeat steps one through five uh, for the number of iterations, where the number of iterations is sort of like the maximum number of anomalies you're testing for. So if you're testing for 20 anomalies, you repeat this 20 times. 
not until you find 20 anomalies. There could not be, maybe there's not 20 anomalies in your data set. You wouldn't want to say, like, there's 20 anomalies just because you're looking for 20. That's very bad, don't do that. And here's an example of how this works, and so this is from uh, Twitter's engineering blog. So they have the time series, and they find these, like, anomalies here of these extreme peaks and these extreme spikes up here. And so, as like I said, use this algorithm, you can find the anomalies in the time series pretty well. This is tested at alpha equals uh, 0 0.05. Now, robust PCA. So this is an algorithm created in 2009. Um, so as you might be familiar with regular PCA, I'm assuming, is anyone not familiar with regular PCA, or what it does? Okay. Uh, didn't see any hands go up. Okay, one person. Uh, so what regular PCA is, you have some matrix, you use singular value decomposition and map, find like a low rate representation of your data. Well, this is like one issue with regular PCA. It's pretty sensitive to outliers. It turns out like if you look at the optimization that the regular PCA tries to solve, it's an L2 optimization. And so as I was talking about earlier, L2 optimizations are sensitive to outliers. And there's also this theorem that we know that says basically the ability for a matrix to handle outliers or specifically corruptions in the data is sort of proportional to its rank. So if you have a low rank matrix, you've lowered its ability to handle outliers or corruptions. And so we need to be able to like fix that when we do PCA. And so what we do we did that is using robust PCA. And so the goal of robust PCA is to sort of identify the normal low rank representation. Then we also want to out identify outliers. And finally, we want to sort of identify the noisy points, the points that we don't care about. And so this is used by Netflix in their robust anomaly detection package. Uh, they have a blog post about this as well, so if you can, you could look that up afterwards if you're more interested in this stuff. And the way robust PCA works is you basically specify some value for your uh, threshold for your singular values. You get, you use a threshold, and you, then you also have a threshold for your error values. And then you just iterate through the data, you apply the singular value decomposition, and you're using your thresholds, you try to classify points into like normal, outlier, and noise. And you sort of repeat until the points are classified, or you sort of repeat to like convergence, and in that case, like no point sort of changes this category. And so you just repeat this process, iteratively doing this, and you can end up with a anomaly detection method for time series um, that allows you to figure out like, oh hey, there are these outliers here, or these like super high spikes, or these super high troughs in Netflix. So this could be like their servers, okay, too many people are watching Stranger Things at this time. And now let's talk about risk score. So this is very useful in like actual practice. So this is like a different from the anomaly, the algorithm stuff I've been talking about. So when you do this in practice, you sort of want to treat it more as a regression problem rather than a classification problem. You don't want to say anomaly normal. You want to say this is 30, this has a score of 30, or this has a score of 50, where higher scores mean more anomalous. And this is sort of like a good practice to make it go from zero to 100 because people sort of intuitively understand a zero 100 scale. Okay, if people see zero, okay, we know it's safe. We see 100 in big spooky red letters, we get scared. We can understand that. And this is actually something that like, the US cyber um, security initiative is actually pushing for companies that do this kind of software to uh, push towards this risk core, ba so risk score based like, methodology. Because people can understand this more easily rather than giving them like, oh hey, here's some like, prob probability values or some likelihood values. And so how can we calculate these risk scores? And so one thing you could do, I mean, is just like take your probabilities, your test statistic or your probability or likelihood, and count and convert this to a zero to 100 scale. So probability value, you could just multiply by 100, boom, you're done. But let's talk about something a bit more complicated, a bit more interesting. So how can we use Bayesian inference to do this stuff? So essentially, we have some measure of risk R. So this could be your test statistic um, in the local outlier phase. This could be the local outlier factor score. And we want to assume that like R comes from well, some well-defined distribution. For example, we're going to assume here, let's say the probability of getting risk score R is equal to this exponential distribution. Uh, that should be an R, not a V. Damn it. Okay. And so, anyways, and so we're going to use this exponential distribution because, like all Bayesian statistics, we sort of want something that's easily computable in the end. And so, the exponential distribution gives us like this nice shape that we want, where it's like a lot of low values and then like rare extreme values. I'll show you a graph at the end. And 
what we can do is like calculate the probability likelihood. So like, what's the probability of getting risk measure R given your user data? Well, if you do this actual like integration out, you can get something like this. So you can get the actual distribution uh, times the probability of lambda given the data. So this is our prior. So we want the distribution on our prior Bayesian statistics. So what can we choose for our distribution for our prior? Well, if we're using the exponential distribution, let's use our conjugate prior of the gamma because the point of the conjugate prior is basically we want something that sort of rigs the posterior to be something e nice and easy at the end. And so you can use Bayes' theorem. It tells us that the probability of lambda given the data is equal to this equation, probability of data given lambda times the probability of lambda get over the probability of data. And now probability data given by lambda is just the likelihood function. You basically look through the data, you calculate the li max likelihood by multiplying the product of each event occurring, and then you choose your uh, probability of lambda from the gamma distribution, so we get a computable posterior. And so if we do this, we get a gamma distribution as our posterior, we get something that's easy to compute, and a way to like, calculate risk scores that's personalized for each user. And so this allows, this is useful, because like, if you give, like, you can have a global risk score function, which is like, take all users in, and they go through this one function, and they get a risk score, versus personalized risk scores, where it's like, each user's risk score has their own personalized risk function. And so we can say, like, okay, maybe this, um, this is normal for this user, is abnormal for this other user. And so this is what that personalized risk scores give us. And so this is what we can get from this Bayesian inference. By looking at their prior data and their prior risk scores, we can sort of, like, come up with a personalized risk score function. And if we do this, we can get something like this. And so this is something that we really want. Like, this is the gamma distribution as the posterior. We sort of get most of our risk scores are zero. They're near the left end. Like, they're not risky. And then we sort of, like, get this decreasing, but we still get some risky values at the right end. Like, there are still some suspicious people. We want to be able to flag those people. But for the most part, we want to say that most people are sort of, like, normal and safe in your organization. If most people are not normal and safe in your organization, well, then again, you have a problem. And now, finally, how we test these algorithms. So be sure to test your algorithms in various different environments, because anomalies change from our highly environment specific. So if you're like working me, computer security, uh, you want to be able to test in a small environment, so maybe like a small startup of 10 to 50 uh, employees, uh, and then also test it in a large company, like uh, maybe 100,000 employees. You want to see like, how does your algorithm's performance differ in this small environment versus this large environment. It still gives you the idea of like, how it captures anomalies, how well it scales to like, larger settings, things of that nature. And also, because like, anomalies are usually rare, you should also try creating, and it's hard to say what is an anomaly without hindsight, you should also create some synthetic data sets. So data sets where you sort of like, have the anomalies built in and you know what you're looking for. And if your method cannot like, capture the anomalies in your synthetic data, then you have a problem. Because if you can't do it on your fake, easy toy example, how are you going to do this in the real world? And finally, since you're going to be like, testing your algorithms continuously, because like I said, like, what is anomalous now might not be anomalous in the future, so you need to be like, test your algorithms continuously. So I'd recommend having a sort of like, automated testing or test harness so you can test your algorithms like, every couple of weeks or every couple of days, depending on what your setting is. And this allows you to keep your algorithms updated as, as like, things change and as like, your problem evolves over time. And I guess that's it for my talk. So. Hello. Uh, for the local outlier uh, factor that you used, uh, how do you choose the best K? Like, uh, how do you come up with the best K to? I mean, so how do you pick K for K means? I mean, that's also an open problem. Statisticians yeah. are trying to try solve that. So it's like, there's no like best method to pick K. I mean, you, there's different like heuristics you can use. You can test multiple K values on different scales. So like one, ten, fifty, a hundred. Um, I specifically use this like one heuristic of like using log of the number of data points I'm gonna be looking at. So if I'm looking at a data set of like 500 users, I use the log of that. I use that as my starting point and sort of like move up and down starting from there. And that's like a good heuristic, but like there's no like best method for picking K because like this is still an open problem in statistics. Okay, thanks. Hello. Let's say you were in a scenario where you were spoiled for choice for the kind of uh, data that you had or the kind of um, characteristics that you could identify as being particularly risky. I, I can't hear you, sorry. Um, 
Well, I guess, how do, you, how do you identify pieces of information that may help you come to a decision to identify anomalous behavior? So if it's hard to identify what an anomaly is, but you know when you see it, um, how, can you see, how can you tell what pieces of data you should include in a model that would model anomalous behavior? I mean, so that's like just like how do you do most data science? You need some domain expertise. You need some, some expert to help come in. And you also need to do like some store feature selection. Like uh, for the case of my problems, we sort of have our own software that we're like, look, things we're monitoring. Like um, if you're doing computer security, you're sort of like monitor, uh, monitoring the domain controllers. And we have like log files. I mean, so we know we, so we can get all the data from the log files. And like we sort of know like what we're looking for based on like what the kind of attacks we're looking for. So if we're looking for like a brute force attack, we know to look for X, Y, and Z, and things of that nature. But like, it's very specific to the domain. Um, and you kind of need to do, like, look at different features and see what works best. Thank you. Hi. Do you have any uh, recommendations or best practices when your like, t training data set is really small? For, for anomaly detection, um, not really like any best practices. Like I mean, there's no like special best practices uh, for like this specific problem versus like general like what you do when you have small data sets. Like you have a very small view data, you have to make do with what you have. Um, the best thing you can do is sort of use methods that don't really require large amounts of data. So to, like don't use deep learning because that requires huge amounts of data. Just try to prefer use methods that sort of require like less amount of data. 